dog. Looks very much like George. Great dog. Uh, right at this very moment, uh, I've got a dog showing in a dog show in California, a Doberman, and he won uh, his class yesterday. So to see a great, big, is it Great Dane, right? Great Dane Massive. Great Dane Massive. 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 Was massive, too. <laughs> big dog. I love it. Hi. So, the thing is, what do I say to, to warm you up? Um, yeah, I've been running around, I guess. I think. Um, what am I doing? Here's what I'm doing. A while ago, I, uh, a guy comes up to me uh, in a line. I'm signing autographs. A guy comes up to me and he says, What? Can you hear me? Yeah. And shut up. This isn't my first rodeo. <laughs> so a guy comes up to me and he says, he knows I ride motorcycles, and he says, I'd like to build you a motorcycle. <laughs> Who am I to refuse? Uh, go ahead. Two, three weeks later, a friend of mine, who's a sculptor, and, and I have some of his work at my house, came up to me and said, you know, what I'd like to do is build a motorcycle, make a motorcycle that would fit into the modern museum in, in, uh, in New York at the moment. And I said, that's the most remarkable coincidence, because there was a guy from an American ranch in Chicago that wants to build me a motorcycle. I'll put the three of us together, and we'll see what... So eventually we met, we talked about motorcycles, and the sculptor decided it was too many people, and he, went, and he left, and I was working with American Ranch in Chicago to build a different type of motorcycle. So these guys made this design, and it, it's unbelievable. It looks like something out of Star Trek. <laughs> with a 500 horsepower engine in it, a Cadillac engine. And and then I said, you know what I'll do? I'll drive that motorcycle from Chicago to Los Angeles. Be great drive. And they said, great, you'll do that again? No question, I'm here. So then I go, and then I thought, I'll, I'll, I'll film it as well. I'll make a documentary on driving a motorcycle from Chicago to Los Angeles. And I'll call it the ride, because everybody will have something, you know, depending on the ride, the reputation, the motorcycle, the life. <laughs> so I, I wanted to sell it. And I went to ESPN, for example, and I said to the executives, I got this thing, I'm gonna drive, I'm gonna have it. And they said, Well, what's it about? I said, well, I don't know. <laughs> it, it, it hasn't happened yet. They said, Well, we can't buy it until we know what it's about. I said, but it's a documentary, a documentary about what it's going to be about. No, we don't want to buy it. So, I got some funds anyway, and I was able to rent a couple of guys with, with cameras and a bus to follow us, and got enough money to film it. And I started doing publicity the week before I started doing publicity. I went to Chicago early and on national shows and shows around Chicago, I went, I'm, I'm going to drive this motorcycle from, Los, from, from Chicago to Los Angeles, we're going to go, we're going to go. And uh, they really got excited. And I, every time I visited the shop that the motorcycle was being built in, they would say, no, 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 don't come here, it's not finished, it's not finished, no, don't, don't, don't come here, don't come, don't. And so I leave. One of the times, 
uh, and we were going to start driving on a Monday. So like on a Friday, I went down there. How's it going? It's not ready yet, it's not ready yet. The father and son are working on it. The son comes outside the, the room where it's being built, and he starts to cry. I put my arm around him. I'm filled with this. I put my arm around him. And I said, why are you crying? I said, I said, are you crying because it's over? Yeah, yeah, that's why I'm crying. I didn't understand that he was crying because the motorcycle wouldn't work. <laughs> so it finally arrives on Monday, 150 pieces of, of, of people, of the press is there. And, and we would unveil the, the light. It's the first time I'd see it. Incredible. We get in. The night before, I saw a, a, a fortune teller, you know, come in and get your fortune told. So I was with the camera and I said, come on in. And we go into the fortune teller. She's a foreign lady. And she's hovering over the crystal ball. And I'm saying, with the motorcycle start. <laughs> she's going on the hey, I don't know the idea. Just tell me, will the motorcycle start? <laughs> will the motorcycle start? You are going to have delayments. <laughs> so we got that on film. So now I go to start the motorcycle and nothing. Motorcycle doesn't work. I'm in front of 150 people snapping shots and cameras and things. We retire to a boardroom and we decide, and this is all on film, we decide I'll rent a motorcycle <laughs> and we'll ship this thing along with the father and son who will now realize why he was crying. <laughs> and we'll bring them, the mechanics, along and they'll fix the bike as we go along. So that's my, the beginning, and how could I have said that to ESPN? I don't know what it's about, but what I think it's about is it won't start. <laughs> Who knew? If I had known that, I'd sold it. So now I've got cameras everywhere. Cam, uh, GoPros, you know what a GoPro is? Little, tiny GoPro. GoPros on motorcycles. I had about 20 cameras going with three guys on, uh, on regular cameras and GoPros everywhere. When I finish, and we, and we well, so much stuff happened along the way, when I finish, I realize I've got a mountain of footage that the gentleman who was supposed to be the cinematographer and organizing all this film, A, B, C, and this is what this contains, so we know what we had, never organized it. So when I handed it to an editor, the guy said, I can't do this, it's too much, it's incredible. There's so much footage here, and I, I, mean, I can't even begin to organize it. Two different people refused to do it after they saw what I had. So the film languished for a while. I didn't know what to do. And then, and the reason I'm telling you the story, is I believe that the universe is taking care of me. Okay? I don't know about God and the finger and the thing. But somehow, when I go to a restaurant, a car leaves the curb and I get a parking space. <laughs> I've got parking karma, what are you laughing at? <laughs> what I don't have, and what the universe isn't taking care of me, is when I have a, I take an airplane and I've got to catch another airplane, the, the, I guess it's an opposite force in the force that's taking care of me. They say, okay, you guys are taking care of Shannon up there. We're going to find something. And they always make the exit gate where I get off the airplane at that end of the airport. And the plane I'm going to catch is at that end of the airport. Invariably, I have parking karma and non-gate karma. <laughs> but there's something at work that takes care of me. Every time I fall into a manure pile, there's a rose <laughs> somewhere. I get a letter. I get a letter from a guy who 
I just met in person today, Tom Cook. He's a professor of cinematography, he's a professor of film at the University of Maine. He writes a letter saying, I read somewhere. Is we're, we're you Maine guys. Yeah. You're what? We're you Maine guys. Do you know Tom Cook? I do not know. <laughs> I thought everybody knew Tom Cook. Oh, Tom Cook, yes. <laughs> you don't know Tom Cook. So, he writes me a letter saying, I'm a professor of cinematography. I read in an interview, you've got all this massive film. Perhaps I can help you edit it. And so for the last several months, I grasped the opportunity. For the last several months, Tom and I have been talking, and he's been editing. We've broken it down into each day. It took eight days to get from Chicago to Los Angeles. We were working on the eighth day. It's, it's an assembly, what we call it. It isn't anywhere near a final edit, but it's an assembly of the film of what, and I find it, transfixing. So I'm now about to try and sell it again to the ESPN or something. It's like, I know what it's about now. <laughs> a guy falls asleep. Uh, we're driving down the highway and a guy falls asleep in his car and crashes into our bus. That's what it's about, okay? <laughs> the, and we have to ship the motorcycle from, the, from, from Chicago to Los Angeles. It never does work. So, so that's what I'm working on. And then, I, 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 it's a wonderful thing. Uh, another thing, um, I did uh, the past year, I did a couple of albums. I did an album, I'm going to stay in the line, look at that. Uh, I did an album, a country music album, um, uh, that uh, got me to sing at the Grand Ole Opry. So I was on the Grand, Grand Ole Opry. Uh, has a circle, maybe four or five feet circle in the center of the stage, where all these guys who were country music, the men and women, uh, when they sing the ground, it's like touchstone. It's like holy, the holy grail. They stand on the wooden circle, and the ghosts of country singers past come, come up. Little.
I'm a think of it. You're a zoo keeper. Yes. You keep a zoo. <laughs> So you're a zookeeper. Yes. Um, What's your question? <laughs> My question is, uh, when you did Star Trek IV with the whales, Slow I... Slow down. <laughs> Sorry. You got me all excited. <laughs> you did Star Trek IV and there was uh, whales. Whales. In that movie. Yeah. And I've come across photos of you swimming with orcas. And I yeah. wanted to know if that was related to... No. Some years ago, they had a, an album out, uh, Sounds of the Deep, I think it was called. Is that what it, you know, the, the sounds of the, of the whales, the whale sounds, on an album. <laughs> you know, the band album. And I had, at the same time that I heard the album, again, the uh, universe is taking care of it, uh, I read a poem by, uh, by, jeez, uh, I had it. A famous author writes a book called Whales Weep Not. Anybody? D.H. Lawrence. Lawrence. Yes, what an audience you are! <laughs> By D.H. Lawrence, exactly. I had it and I lost it. You gave it back to me. God, thank you so much. <laughs> so D.H. Lawrence writes a poem about whales. They say the sea is cold, but the sea contains the hottest blood of all. Okay, that's the first one. I mean, wow, whale sounds and that poem. What a combination. So I edit the sounds of the deep. They say the sea is cold. sometime around there, says to me, we'd love you to come and do a number, anything you want to do. And I said, in my living room, I'm putting together D.H. Lawrence's poem and the sounds of the deep. And he says, wow, that's wild. <laughs> I said, I could do that. He says, we're playing the Hollywood Bowl in a few weeks. Would you like to do a Hollywood Bowl? Hollywood Bowl. Contains <laughs> eighteen thousand people come to a concert. The full, the full concert is eighteen thousand people. When you stand on stage and you look up there, you can't see the people in the farthest reaches. It's so far away. That's how big it is. I said, I'll do it there. So. At the Hollywood Bowl that day, they announce it, and I come on stage, and they're all looking like you're looking. What's he going to do? And I go, and the sound goes on. And the audience goes, what the hell? We're here to hear the Philharmonic. The sea is cold, it's out of silence. 18,000 people. What the hell is that? What is Shannon sh up to dead? He's standing there. And I did it. And it was successful enough that I traveled all over the country with the Philharmonic doing that as an outdoor auditorium. The next thing. The next thing, this isn't about Star Trek, do you mind? Thank you for answering my very upset. I haven't finished yet. <laughs> I got another story. So I'm invited to go up to, why was I going there? Uh, uh, an environmental group needed some publicity. And they said if you go up to uh, North 
north of San Francisco, there's an orca thing going on, and you can attend, you know, you can feed an orca, and it will we'll get some publicity for this environmental thing. Oh, okay, I like that. So, so we're now, I fly up there, and now we're driving in a limo on our way a few miles north of San Francisco, and I'm reading the newspaper, and we're on our way, and I'm reading the newspaper that in San Diego, they have the same orca display where the orcas swim around. And by the way, I've been reading a lot about orcas, and we'll talk about that in a second, about the shame of, of, of us incarcerating them. But at that moment, yes, I'm with you. The, I'm reading an article in which the orca in San Diego dragged down the trainer and was playing or was angry at the trainer and either drowned her or almost drowned her. And I'm reading this article and I'm going to go feed an orca. <laughs> so I get to the place and the guy says to me, the trainer, uh, gets to me. And they said, okay, Bill, would you like to get in the water with the orca? <laughs> I'm thinking, I got parking car. should be all right. <laughs> and this is what he says to me. Going to get uh, whatever the name of the orca was that they named the orca. And, and, and you sit on the edge of the dock here. Let keep your, your, uh, your, uh, who's coming, who's talking? Gee, what are you saying, guys? Is it as interesting as the orca story? <laughs> Sit here on the edge of the dome. Put your arms out by Jesus. That's, that's annoying. Uh, what's your name? In red. In red. What's your name? I want you to yell. Shut up! Shut up! <laughs> that's so rude. Sit on the dock, get your legs open like this, put your arms up like this, and the orca will come up. Then put your feet on the fins, and you'll be able to dance with the orca. Now, Bill, I'm going to tell you something right now. Very, very carefully. I'm going to blow a whistle after you dance, and I want you, as quickly as possible, to swim back to the dock. <laughs> And he's saying with that seriousness, and I'm thinking, good lord, that orca in San Diego, what? Wow. Okay. <laughs> and that's what happened. I danced with the orca. I had my arms around the orca, my feet on his feet, and he whirled around. The whistle blew, so the orca went for a fish, and I swam as quickly as possible back. It's <laughs> very impressive. That's up. Now, the other two sentences. Orcas are, we don't know how intelligent they are. We don't know what kind of feeling they have. Same goes for the elephant. You know what? It goes for all the animals. It's a zookeeper. You understand what I mean? And the argument for zoos and against zoos are we become acquainted with the animals. We go to the zoo, we become acquainted with the animals. We understand how we're destroying their environment and them and making these beautiful beings that belong to the earth as much as we do. We're destroying them, and we, but we become acquainted with the animals in a zoo. We see them for what they are, and maybe it raises our consciousness. Yes, that's exactly. Okay, Thank you. that's the two arguments. Thank you. Thank you so much. He's not interested in me at all. Is he? What is your question, young man with a Western hat and Western boots? <laughs> what, what, what did he say? That's a young well, lady. You know, I made that mistake the other way. <laughs> In line, a, a, a young person came out and took, his, took their hat off, and I said, young lady, and he said, I'm a man, I'm a boy. <laughs> now I've said, you're a young boy, you're a young lady. I, I, I have no, no way of going. But you know, you're beautiful. You're a beautiful young lady. Aww. I can see that. But you've got all the Western clothes on. So what you are is a beautiful Western dressed young lady 
You look great. Do, 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 are you interested in the web? Look, you've got a holster and a, and a gun. What, 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 uh, what uh, uh, kind of gun? Right into that microphone, right into that microphone. Oh, I'm Judith from The Walking Dead. Oh, from The Walking Dead. Yes. I better see you. Your question better be about Star Trek, I can tell you that. It is. Well, it's not really a question. It's something you probably already know. But I was watching this thing on Halloween the other day at school, and apparently it was one of your masks that were used for Halloween for the character, and they just spray painted it. And it yeah. was Michael Myers' mask. Yeah. So they said, we need something scary. Yeah. So they ran out to a Halloween store, and they had made a mask of my face while I was doing Star Trek in order to put makeup on and experiment with what we call prosthetics, you know, an eye, a nose, whatever they were going to do. So instead of me lying there while they experiment, they could experiment on this mask that had my proportions. So somebody stole the mask and made masks and they were selling them in Halloween stores and the guys who directed the uh, Halloween, Halloween you know, they, they ran up and got my mask and made it into the bad guy. Yeah. Is that fun? <laughs> you kind of like that, right? Yeah, I didn't. Who's this? 
arrogant little pig. And he didn't speak to me for weeks. Yeah, he was insulted that I would, I would have said that. I meant it. I guess I meant it arrogantly. I mean, he's a film actor, and film actors say, hello, what's my line? Mostly. But uh, it was a joy. It was a joy to be on, on that stage with these remarkable talents. Uh, in all their flaws, uh, their human being, Judy Garland, was drinking a lot during those times. She was totally out of it. Uh, during the one day she had on stage, Burt Lancaster uh, had this smile. You know, this a, he had this thing. He was Burt Lancaster. So he was playing a German, I think he was the financier. Uh, he was a Nazi at any rate, and he gave a speech. And, you know, it was Burt Lancaster giving a speech. The end of which, everybody waited, it was one day, goodbye. And then, later that evening, we were told, Mr. Lancaster wants to come back. He didn't, wasn't happy with what he did, he wants to come back and do it again. So the next day he came back and did exactly the same thing he had done the day before. <laughs> yeah, he did this thing. And then he was happy. Uh, Spencer Tracy was phenomenal. Montgomery Clift. Uh, it, it was, the, that movie, which got a lot of awards and a lot of talk, uh, Judgment of Nuremberg many years ago, uh, it was, uh, was a milestone in, in what I was doing in Hollywood. I enjoyed it uh, enormously and, and it has remained uh, a, a movie that's uh, played every so often. It's a classic of some kind because of that. Yes, sir. Um, I really enjoyed Better Late Than Never, the series that you did. Better Late Than Never. Yeah. So much fun. Uh, any possibility of uh, future seasons? And did you enjoy uh, filming the show? I did. Uh, whether it comes back or not, I'm not sure. Um, because it's so expensive. They had five expensive people who had to travel. <laughs> and then about a hundred other people working the show. So we were traveling from country to country, trying to be funny and ad living and, and uh, but it was hard work, and uh, it was a tough, you get up in the morning, have to travel, uh, play someplace uh, for two or three days, travel some more, it was tough. But those people, those people were incredible. Terry Bradshaw, uh, the great quarterback, is tough. He has four rings. Super Bowl rings. He was a Super Bowl quarterback. Tough guy. He told me a story of a linebacker. Went to tackle him. Whistle was blown. The play was dead. But the linebacker, in those days, you get away with more you can now, picked him up, turned him upside down, head first, and drove him into the ground. He did something to his neck, he was a paraplegic in that moment. He couldn't move. He told me he was weeping. I, 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 I can't move my arms, I can't move my legs. Two, three days later, the bruise or whatever it was uh, dissolved. He got his arms and legs back. The next Sunday, he was playing football. That's how tough it was. He was a tough, tough man. We're in Sweden. Uh, they eat fermented cod. <laughs> Oh, you know, fermented cup, fermented cup. So we're given a can of fermented cup. The idea each day was, you know, you, you get something and we add a little bit and make a scene about it. So they handed us a can of fermented cup, which was already swelled. It was already enlarged. And they said, uh, you know, open the can and see what you do. So we're sitting around opening. What they didn't tell us is that the Swedes open the can underwater so that when it explodes, because it's full of gas, because it's fermented. They didn't tell us to do that. So, uh, I think it was Terry opens the can, boom, it explodes, and this, I've worked as a policeman, pretend policeman for five years, TJ I, I, I spent a lot of time with policemen who would see dead bodies all the time, 
dead bodies that were decaying, weeks, the smell. They would tell me about the smell, they put it in the but they get used to it. They told me that the dead bodies that smell so bad, the fermented cod is far, far dead. <laughs> and they asked us uh, on the show to if, see if you can eat a fermented cod. Nobody wanted to touch it. I, I popped some fermented cod. So Terry Bradshaw's like screaming like a little child. <laughs> and then I picked up a piece of fermented cod and I looked him in the eye and he knew what was going to happen. So he started running. And I ran after him. And I'm chasing one of the great quarterbacks of all time. He turns to the left, comes out of his shoes and falls to the ground. I jump on him and I He said later, the most embarrassing moment of his life was being run down by Shaq. <laughs> <laughs>